Approximately two, approximately two and three quarters million s soldiers served in the American Civil War. About two million served in the Union Army and 750,000 served the Confederacy. The Union suffered at least 360,000 deaths and the Confederacy at least 260,000. Um, recent studies are showing that the figures were probably higher than that. They're not exact. That's a lot of men to have lost. The majority of soldiers on both sides were farmers. It was a rhythmic occupation that varied little from year to year. Most were from small, close-knit communities where the majority of their contacts were family and neighbors. Their lives revolved around home and church. Nothing in prior life prepared them to be soldiers. When the call came for men to sign on as soldiers, some individuals were very eager to fight for their beliefs for both North and South, and they readily added their names to the rosters. Others enlisted for the initial three months service as a way to get off the farm for a, a short getaway. They had no idea what they were in store for. Some enlisted because their friends were signing on and it was kind of the thing to do, and others were drafted, so they had no choice. The average age of the soldiers at enlistment was about 26 years. These naive young men had nothing to prepare them for the battle and the aftermath. Although death was a part of everyday life, it was nothing like they saw in the battle. Um, much of the combat was hand to hand. Soldiers were up close um, to the people that they killed and when they saw their comrades kill, killed next to them. Technology had improved weaponry from previous wars, so the wounds were um, much more horrific. Um, in the aftermath of a battle, men lay dead or dying, scattered all over the fields. They had seen nothing like this in their lives before the war. Now, as Pam and I told you in a, in a um, lecture that we did on Victorian mourning customs, the Victorians had very ritualized burial practices and procedures that were followed um, closely before the war. And I've got a number of pictures of some of the things. People dressed in black. They covered mirrors with uh, black fabric. They, hang, they hung mourning wreaths on the doors. Um, lots of flowers in the house and the caskets were actually in the home for wakes. They made jewelry out of um, the deceased person's hair, so they had something of them to keep. Um, these rituals were more for the comfort of the living than for the dead. While the soldiers couldn't follow the same practices um, for those who died in battle, sometimes they didn't even get a chance to bury them. That was a stress for the soldiers because this is not the way things should be done. In most cases, the soldiers were the sole providers for their families. The war removed them from their families, so they couldn't provide. When they received their pay, which wasn't always regular, um, they could send some money home to their families, but what about all the work that had to be done? This is another stress on the soldiers. The soldiers spent all of their time outdoors. As the war progressed, they had insufficient food and clothing, and often unsanitary conditions in camp, more stress. Military units in the Civil War were usually formed in a geographical region. So that provided a little piece of home um, for the people that were serving um, because they had neighbors and, and family sometimes around them, but it also proved devastating when those in close contact, when they went into battle and they were losing their neighbors and their, their close friends. Then in some instances, brothers fought on opposite sides. Um, Soldiers were aware of that, so they knew they could be shooting at family members. So that was probably one of the worst stresses in the battle. Of course, the biggest and most obvious stress was the war itself. On the battlefield, gunfire and artillery fire were all around. It was noisy, dirty, and confusing. Some lives were lost to friendly fire. It was a small piece of hell repeated over and over with each battle. Of the soldiers who were lucky enough to live, many of them would eventually ret return home missing an arm or a leg or both. 
The soldiers dreamed of returning to their homes that they had left behind with all of its creature comforts. They left young wives or fiancés who would be waiting for them. Some of them left young children at home. They dreamed of going back home to this. When the war ended and the soldiers began to make their way home, they were sometimes in for unexpected and unpleasant shocks. Their wives and children they returned to weren't as they remembered. Wives were older and much more independent than those they'd left. Fiancés didn't always wait for the soldiers to return. Children had grown and changed. Some had lost their parents or other close relatives in their absence. They returned to homes and outbuildings that weren't as well kept as the ones they had left behind. This was especially true in the South, where homes and other this is, a, this is an independent woman having to drive because the husband's lost his arm. Mm. Um, in the South, homes, factories, public buildings, and, other, and houses of worship and other buildings were ransacked or burned. So this is some of the things they were returning to. Factories burned, a church is burned out. There were brothers or friends who didn't return from the war. Most of them picked up the pieces and carried on with life but for others it wasn't possible. Soldiers that had lost limbs to adjust, had to adjust to their new limitations. Some could no longer perform the jobs that they had done prior to the war. This would have meant adapting or finding a new occupation. Some of the, set, some of the soldiers could not settle back in the regular day-to-day -day life as they had known it. They restlessly moved from one place to another. They, they couldn't go back to the way things were. The mental scars that soldiers took home with them often proved to be the hardest to overcome. The terms post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury wouldn't be used until much later in time, but they certainly experienced these problems. Terms that were used at that time were nostalgia, mania, or simply insanity. Some ex-soldiers some ex um, chose to end their lives by suicide. And actually some of the soldiers while they were in, in, still in the war chose to end their lives by suicide. Others were committed to asylums or they went to spend the remainder of their lives in veterans homes. In 1870 there were at least 3,200 veterans living in veterans homes. Now that doesn't sound like a lot but remember the average age of the soldiers when they enlisted was 26. So by 1870, they were still probably only in their mid-30s. So that, that is a lot of young men living in homes. In 1879, the U.S. Um, Attorney General estimated that about 45,000 veterans were addicted to morphine, which is, that was a figure that I didn't know anything about until I was researching this. Organizations formed that reunited veterans in a peacetime setting and help them incorporate the experience of the war into their current lives. The group in the North was the Grand Army of the Republic, known as the GAR. The organization in the South was the United Confederates Veterans, or the UCV. And I've got some other pictures. These are all Grand Army of the Republic medals. And this is the um, United Confederates Veterans logo. I couldn't find as much on them. But these groups had local chapters and they held annual reunions for many years. These provided um, mental um, stability for the soldiers. There was no one at home they could talk to about what they'd experienced. The only other people that would understand it were other soldiers that had served. So um, it, was, it was very cathartic for them to, to be able to meet with people that had served and to talk to them. There were hundreds of GAR chapters across the northern states and at least 15 in Monroe County. Um, there was a post in Webster. Oh, I guess it went too fast. Is this the Fairport one? Fairport, yes, there was yes. one in Fairport, there was one in Webster, and there was one in Rochester. The soldiers from Penfield that joined up belonged to one or the other of those. So there were at least 15 of them in Monroe County. The peak membership was in 1890 with 490,000 members. 
They helped to establish regular pensions for the veterans. They promoted voting rights for the black veterans, and they helped to make a Memorial Day a national holiday. The GAR held a national encampment every year from 1866 to 1949, and they had, they had badges or pins like this. I have a couple of them that we own in the History Room on display up here. Um, so you'd go attend this, and it was all veterans, and they had things, like this is a badge. The uh, box that we have, there's some pieces of silverware they got, like a knife and a spoon and a fork that says National GAR Encampment. Um, this, was a, this was a parade that was part of the GAR, some of the veterans riding in the parade. These were good things for mental health to show that people remembered and, and appreciated the veterans. Um, this is a group reenacting a band. And you can see they're getting up in age. They slept in tents and, and, and reenacted things that they had done in camp life. And this is one veteran. You can see he's not a spring chicken anymore, taking time out for himself. Um, <clears throat> I lost my picture of the stamp. Nope, now we're into the southern. Okay, the, U, the United States Postal Service created a stamp to commemorate the last encampment. I don't know what happened to the picture of it. Maybe it'll turn up later. The GAR was formally dissolved after the death of its last member, who was Albert Wilson in 1956. He was still living after I was born. That's pretty amazing. Um, the... Uh, UVC formed later than the GAR, but served a similar purpose to the veterans in the South. They held re reunions. This is one of, this was a postcard actually that they created. Oh, there's the, I don't know how we got there. Okay, this is interesting. So the, in 19, um, 1941, they created this stamp for the GAR, and you can see on, at the top it says, Final national encampment of the of the um, I just say GAR somewhere. Yeah, there it is. And then this was one of the encampments for the uh, for the Confederate. And then they got a stamp created for them in 1956. And if you look real closely, the only thing changes the wording. It's the exact same mm -hmm. stamp with different wording on it. <laughs> but it it showed the uh, soldiers that were still remaining at that time, that, they, that their, their fights hadn't been in vain. And I'm going to leave this picture up, because it's a touching picture, two old veterans, north and south, together. And I want to talk a little bit what I know about a couple of the Penfield soldiers. Most of them, like the soldiers across the country, came back and picked up their lives. Um, most of them were farmers. They came back to the farms and, and made do. If they lost a limb, they they um, acclimated to what they had to do. But a couple of the soldiers, I found unique st stories um, about the war, how the war had forever changed their lives. One of them was a man named Bernard Matthews. He was raised on a farm in Penfield, and he enlisted in the 108th New York Infantry in August of 1862. He was wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg on July 3rd, 1863, and he had his right leg amputated below the knee. He was hospitalized until the following spring, 1864, and then in November of that year, he was discharged. He didn't see any more battle after he'd lost his leg. But he returned to Rochester. He didn't return to farming. He learned to make artificial limbs. And he, he later moved to New York City, and then he moved to various locations throughout the South, making artificial arms and legs for Confederate soldiers that had lost them in the, in the war. He was married in 1870 and settled in Louisville, Kentucky. So he was one who was able to actually use his disability to um, enable him to, to move on to another profession in the rest of his life. Silas Robbins was another Penfield native who listed in the 108th Infantry. He was wounded at the Battle of Cold Harbor and lost his right arm near the shoulder. <clears throat> he had a lengthy recovery, during which time he almost died twice. He finally recovered enough to be sent home, only to learn that his father had died while he was gone, and then his mother died a year later. He married and had children, 
But his uh, stump was very painful. It caused him a great deal of pain for the rest of his life. There were, they called them tumors. I don't know what they were. Something was growing around there. And they said he could go back and have f further surgery, but he didn't want anything to do with that. So he was, the rest of his life was affected by the constant pain that he had. Another Penfield young man. I know a lot about the 108th because they published a book which is available online with some of their own writings of their own experiences. This guy didn't write about himself. I just found out about him through the grapevine. Clark Euchre enlisted in the 108th Infantry with several of his neighbors. They lived in the Roseland or the northeast uh, part of Penfield in August of 1862. It seems that he was not cut out for the the um, life of a soldier. But I think he enlisted because the neighbors were enlisting and it was, it was what they were doing. Um, we know from a letter from another man, the first time their unit went into battle, he turned around and ran. So he wasn't cut out for battle. Um, he deserted in November of 1862 and went to Canada. I followed him through the census um, up into the 1900s. He never came back to the States. He made a life for himself and married and had children in Canada. So his life was drastically changed because he, he was no longer a United States citizen. Um, Calvin Allen joined the 9th New York Heavy Artillery in September of 1864. He participated in several battles and served until the end of the war. He returned home and married. And he was later declared insane. He was sent to the asylum at Rochester where he died in 1898. Now, maybe he would have gone insane anyway. Maybe what he saw on the battlefield is what caused him to later go insane. We don't know that. And one other soldier that I've talked about a lot for other reasons was the Almond Stroger. He um, grew up in Penfield. He and his brothers were very inventive. Um, they tried to invent a flying machine. They, they experimented with it off the roof of their one-story house. He enlisted as a bugler in the 8th Cavalry, went off, fought in the war, or bugled in the war, came back to town, and it was like he was restless. He couldn't stay still. He taught school here. He was the principal. He moved on throughout the, the Midwest and, and the West. He ended up having five wives. Um, he, not all at once. <laughs> one at a time. One at a time. <laughs> but um, he, he um, was the inventor of the automatic switch for the telephone. Now, that had nothing to do with the Civil War, um, whatever came out of the Civil War, but it was just that he was so restless. And we have other stories of soldiers that came back and they just couldn't be still. So, um, you know, we, we know about the stresses from war that we hear about what the soldiers coming back from uh, Iraq and um, Afghanistan today, things weren't any different in the past. They had the same, um, they carried the same scars, mental scars with them that the soldiers do today. So they had to adapt. And that's, that's about it, unless there's any questions. Liz. That, that uh, applies also to the women veterans. That's right. They've just recently been publicizing that more, and there is a women's veterans department over in Canada that is devoted solely to women veterans. Um, one thing with these, you know, with the with the veterans in the from the Civil War, because the because of the weaponry was becoming. To us, it doesn't seem very technologically advanced, but it was for the time. But they were still fighting as if they had old-fashioned weapons. And there could just be so many more horrific um, things done to bodies. They saw this, you know. They, and these were these naive farm boys. Um, they, nothing they'd seen prepared them for that. It only gets worse as the weapons get worse, mm -hmm. I think. I can remember being in England and they were doing a festival in a castle and they were doing the siege machines and uh, rock tossers and air pumps. Hmm. Any other questions or anybody want to say anything? That's it. I told you I'd be fast. Yeah.